Well, I'll start on, on the topic that Shiva spoke about. Um, the Rashiva usually makes the bracha before the Rashiva washes for Nitila Sedai. I've seen that uh, growing up. Um, does the Rashiva recommend that we do that? Um, meaning, we saw from other, we saw from some later Achorim, they say it seems the custom in Am Yisrael is to, is to wash and then make the bracha. But if we know for sure, our hands are clean. And then also the question is, how clean exactly? Like we, if the person always constantly didn't scratch his head or, so two part of the question. A, with, if we know for sure that our hands are clean, does Rashi recommend that we make a bracha beforehand? And then second of all, if we're not 100% sure, what should we do? The Mishnah Bura recommends, not my fault. The Mishnah Bura is the Bura. He quotes the Rishayim. He said, the Palatites has right. justified their practice of saying the bracha after. But he says, if you know your hands are clean, the Rishayim says, I'm allowed to say the bracha before. So it's not that there's a minion to that to say the bracha before. They justified the practice that they had that it's also acceptable to say the bracha after. Say the bracha before, for sure it's all good. So a person who goes to Shachris and he washed Negevasa and he's having Shachris and he comes home and he's having a bagel for breakfast. Or a lot of times they'll have breakfast in Shul. Or right after Shachris they'll give out, uh, there's a shear and they'll give out uh, food or there's a bris. In that situation a person should make the bracha and then wash. I would think so, yeah. You touch the film. Tefillin? Or if he touched his tefillin or he touched yeah, his hands yeah, yeah. above over here when he was putting on the tefillin, would that be enough of a reason to... No. That's the time is how you're dying, but if you're allowed to say a bracha, say a bracha on the tefillin. Even if it's the yeah, Mukham is not Mukham. what the Rav said about the Rambam, I didn't understand. I mean, I don't know if I understood it, but... Uh... No, no, that's a question. If you wash until it's done, then you touch tefillin. Maybe that's the time is how you're done. But, but it does make hands dirty that you're not allowed to so say that's a bracha. So that's if we hold by the Rambam that it's only... But if we hold by the Ravid, then we have to because it's a, if it's... I don't know if that's a loch or it's just a shkaf. No, like no, saying, that's a person puts on his tefillin in the morning. How does he say the bracha? And there's an asach vino. It's metamis ha'yadayim, but you're allowed to say a bracha with tefillin. If you have stami daim, askoni you're saying, then you're not allowed to say a bracha. Also you're allowed to say a bracha. Also you're allowed to say, if you know your hands are dirty, you're not allowed to say a bracha. Stami daim, askoni you're saying, doesn't prevent you from saying no, a bracha. No, but let's say your father would have taken on the Sefer Torah at yeah. the, and be mafir on the Sefer, so then when the, when the Balabas asked, about then you would have to, it would be the time of Sayyidan, you have to wash again for bread. But there's no din that you're not allowed to say a bracha after you touch the sifta. Let's say I get an aliyah, then I say a bracha, I just touch the sifta. That's not a problem. Ah, so, okay. It's the time of Sayyidan, but you can still say brachas. At least continue to daven after you get an aliyah. It's still daven. Okay. And when putting on tefillin, should a person be careful not to touch his forearm as like makum uh, mechusin? And if you he should, does, some should. people have like a spritzer. The founding fathers in the United States they took a bath once or twice a year. When the body would smell, they would throw perfume on. And the Shulnach is like that. They never bathed so often. The Jews bathed a lot. The Jews went to mikveh, so the Jews were cleaner than the Nachum. And there used to be epidemics in Europe. The Jews never suffered, so that's why they accuse the Jews that they're responsible. They, 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 they caused the epidemic. Because the women went to mikvah and the men always watched until Zion. Men went to mikvah, so we were cleaner than the guys. But even the Jews, they didn't bathe so often. So that's why it's, it's, everything is different today. So the only dinim that if you touch your arm, you have to, uh, you, over here, the part that's you have to wash your hands. All these dinim probably don't apply today. The acronym, the, re, the reasons from the right And, Many of the dinim don't and scratching the head also. Or the parts of the thigh. It's greasy. If you take the head, used to, the hair used to be greasy. We use shampoo. We <laughs> something you even take a shower once a day. Some are not, but even once a day. Take a you touch your hair, you, you don't have to wash. So, a person also wearing shorts in the summer, and he touches, let's say, his thigh. Or, could be all these dinim. All these dinim would. All these dinim don't apply. Today. Unless he's mama shvitzi. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the Shulchan Aruch Paskins that b'makom sakana a person doesn't need to wash his hands, like in the midbar he doesn't need to even venture out to the seventy-two minutes because it's b'makom sakana. So someone wanted to suggest, uh, Rav Pinchas, that if uh, if we hold today that that flying a person it rises to the level of sakana that you would have to bench goyma, would that mean that on the plane he would be part of the mitzvah sezai? Benching goyma. In Shulchan Aruch, they have a, a pshara. 
that the four people who are mentioned in Tillin and that Perik and Tillin, they say Goyim will even if there was no Sakon. Ove Hayanan, you say Goyim will even if there was no Sakon. And then if there was a whole, if it was an armed robbery in my store, I used to be the rabbi in a shul in Paramus for a couple of years. So there was one man, he was a Persian, and every other week he would say Bechot HaGemo. He had a, he used to sell Persian rugs. And every other week there would be an armed robbery in his store. They would, they would steal all the money. So every other week he would say Bechot HaGemo. So, so the four mentioned in Tillin, they say Bechot HaGemo, even if there's no Sakon here, there's not. They mentioned in Tillin. But then if there was a Sakon in it, and then if there was a... But, so the Ovei HaYamim, that's what people listen to. Ovei HaYamim is one of the four mentioned. The say Rav Evel HaSalavechik felt that Yorde HaYam, and Tillim had said Yorde HaYam, means that he went in a ship. But he went in a plane, that's not Yorde HaYam, that's Ovei HaYam, so that's not in Tillim. So if there was, if there was a takas, a plane was hijacked, so then you were Bisakana, so then you say, if you weren't Bisakana, you weren't Yorde HaYam, you were Ovei HaYam, so Rav Evel said you don't say Bisakana. With regards to Chatzitza, the Shulchan Aruch Paskins that the halachas of Chatzitza apply also to to Netzilah Sedaim. So when we're learning Hilchos Nida, we learned all the different uh, Chatzitzas that apply. Um, we saw that with regards to the nail polish uh, that a woman has, it's Bedarkal sits the Darabon and it's a the Makbit, and therefore she can wash even though she's wearing nail polish. The Arlet Siva Paskins that if her nail polish cracks, and then she is Makbit, so then it would be a Chatzitza for Netzilah Sedaim. Um, would the Rashiva say the same thing? And then the question becomes, what do you do on Shabbos? A woman's nail polish <coughs> cracks on Shabbos, so should she take it off? How could she take it off? Um, and, yeah, and and would it be considered, uh, would the cracked nail polish be a chatzitza? If she would walk around, she wouldn't go to Hasana with a cracked nail polish, but she would, she would go to work. What's the get there? Because it's, it's common. Oh, yeah. Let's say it starts growing off, or it starts chipping. So she chips, starts chipping. Chips, so she would not go to a wedding like that. She no, but she would go to work, maybe, or she would continue. I think. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. That's a good question. That's what to discuss. Could be then. Could be a tamaki. And then taking it off on Shabbos, there's no. Uh, you can't do. It. I don't know. <laughs> You saw the loch is then taking off. Yeah, you is it, if putting it on is kaiser, then you take it off as meichay. Because it's on, because it's on the nose. Yeah, put it back. Putting it on is kose. Kose or to vei amigi. Vei amigi. I don't know. Got to think about that. We saw when we learned Hilchos Nida, there was a, a story of uh, Rav Neivit passing. There was a woman who went to the. It wasn't Shabbos, but she went to the mikvah, and she couldn't get a piece of the nail polish off. So they called uh, Rav Neivet, and he said, very simple, he says, color all the rest of the ones. He says, it's only a miyat of makbit, since there's a little bit that you want to get off. He says, but if you color all of them perfect, so then uh, it becomes a miyat of makbit. Um, with regards to a person who is about to start a meal, and then he goes to the bathroom. So we saw three shitas in the Shulchan Aruch, and the Roshanim, and, and in the Achrayim as well. So shita number one, is with the Shulchan Aruch Paskins. He says to wash, make a Asha Yatzar, to wash again, and then make an Al Tila Sedai. And Shavuah points out that the first washing shouldn't be a Kasher Natila, because if it's a Kasher Natila, so then you can't make an Al Tila Sedai on the second one. So he says use less than a Rafi, so use a little bit. So, and, and Rosh Zalman says today, what that would be is wash it under the sink, say Asha Yatzar, and then wash again with, uh, wash again Al Tila Sedai. The other one we saw is that wash two full Natilas, and then in the middle, scratch your head, which the Roshiva says wouldn't work today anyways. <laughs> unless the person is Mama uh, Shvitzing. And then uh, and then the other sheet that we saw, and this is what they say in the name of the Chavetz Chaim, even though the Meshavura says the other way, the the Chuva Sanagas brings it, he says that the Chavetz Chaim, he would wash his hands once, he would recite al Natil Sedaim, he would dry his hands, and then he would say in Asher Yatzar before Hamaytzi, because the Shulchan Aruch says that Toiv Lizar, not to talk, after the natil, in between the natila and the and the and the washing itself, and the hamaytzi. So, uh, what, what did, out of these three, what would the Rashiva pasuk the Maisa or the Rashiva has a, a different custom, a different? No, usually I wash my hands today. I'll show up, and then you wash again a second time. Wash, wash with the faucet, without a cup. 
And is the Rashiva Makbit to dry his hands before washing the Tiyan Sedai? It's in Yeshu. It's in Yeshu. When I wash my. It's in Yeshu Hanarach. If your hands are dirty, then you first pour, first pour water on your hands to clean them. Then you have to dry them off. Then you wash a second time. It's considered as if that's the beginning of the Nitzvah <coughs> Sedai. If I went to the bathroom and my hands are, uh, are uh, dirty from the base I keep there, I would wash them under the faucet, then I wouldn't dry my hands, then I would pour water on the balance of the night. That was the beginning of the cleaning of my hands. And Stam is like, not, not, not going to the bathroom. Stam, the Rashiva goes to eat lunch and wash it. I think, so the Rashiva would not I think based on Mishnah, I said dying. There's some who claim that he's supposed to have your hands dry before. Because the water will be tame. It's not going to be tame. Yeah. The new water that you put, I never understood that. interesting you talked about uh, talked about being mafsik uh, in between the bracha and tilis adayim and hamoitzi so the Nagi Bihuda has in his uh, he has a few volumes collections of drushes he has a drushes that he said on Shabbos Shuba he gave Musa to the Balabatim so one Shabbos he gave Musa Shabbos, uh, Shabbos Shuba that um, the same design is on the bagel and he told him last year that it's supposed to be Hamoitzi. There must be something wrong with me. I can't convey my... He's threatening to resign his Rabbanus over the Mezaynas on the bagel. <laughs> he says, he told you last year, and they didn't, they didn't understand it. He, he must be something wrong with him. He said, I can't explain. And then he's complaining. He's complaining why... This is very common today. People watch him till he said, and they talk, they carry on conversations. He says, he says, he says, he says, and then they talk between the Tilsa Daim and the Bracha. Then after they say the Bracha, they don't say boo. Till they say Amoite, they don't say boo. And he says, it's all wrong. He says, the Ika Hefzik is when you say Bracha, Alatilas Lulav. And then you talk before you shake the Lulav. So the Bracha is not with Suz to the Lulav. So you have to, it's a Bracha of Atal, you have to repeat the Bracha. And what if you did the Tilsa Daim and the meaning is that people say the Bracha after? So if you're going to talk in between the Nathila Sedaim and the Bracha, that will be a Hefzik. The Bracha will not be mitzvah back. So you're not going to say the Bracha. You are yotze the Nathila Sedaim without the Bracha. You are yotze the mitzvah without the Bracha. And if you talk, it's just like if you talk, if you said the Bracha before a mitzvah, and you talk in between the Bracha and the mitzvah, the Bracha is no longer mitzvah. So you have to say the Bracha a second time on the Lansi Hasam. So if you practice this, say the Bracha Nathila Sedaim after you washed, if you talk in between the mitzvah and the bracha, the bracha will not be mitzvah, but the mitzvah you already want kind. So don't say the bracha, it'll be a bracha of atolim. He says that's <coughs> improper, that people talk in between the tilis hodaim and the bracha. So he says, after they said the bracha, then you don't say amoitzi. He says, the din is you're not allowed to talk to carry on a whole conversation. It'll be a hesel hadas, that you're not allowed to do. When someone asks you a question, you want to give a monosyllabic answer. Yes, no, maybe, something like that. Two words. He said, that's not a hefzik. There is no din of hefzik, he says. That's a chumrah, not to talk at all. He said, it's a din not to carry on a conversation about a side topic. That's hefzik. <coughs> Interesting. He complains everybody does backwards. <laughs> Same thing, the licht benching. The women have the practice of the bracha. After they do all the hadlokas, a lot of women, they might lick the candles, then they blow out the, then they blow out the match, then they walk to the kitchen, they throw the match out, then they say, Yehirotzen, then after they finish all the trinas, then they, then they wake up and they say, the bracha, la havik, na He said, if you talk in between the hadloke, or you do so, you're walking around, you, you make a hep soke, in between the hadloke, and there is in the bracha, the bracha will not be mitzvah, in the mitzvah you already con- completed. The bracha is not miyakim in the mitzvah, so the bracha is not mitzvah, so don't say the bracha. He says, it'll be a bracha of atala. People violate that all the time. The women violate it they, by talking in between the Adlaka and the Bracha and the Mahavik and the Shabbos. And the men, by, everybody violates. They talk in between the Nitzel Sedaim and the Bracha that they say yes to. When we learned the Allah, there was someone in the Shir who made a cup. And on the cup he wrote, Don't uh, don't talk after washing. Good. So <laughs> you should sell those cups. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Uh, with regards to to Pasa Baba Kisni, so we got into the sugya a little bit of uh, a Pasa Baba Kisni and, and being Kavea Suda. So we saw that if a person is Kavea Suda and Pasa Baba Kisni, you would have to you have to wash before and you would have to bench afterwards. And the Magen Avram um, is the Shulchan Aruch quotes the Magen Avram, who says that even if we're not eating the shear of Kavea Suda. Of, from the past of Baba Kisni, but we're eating other things that uh, melaft and mitzapas. It's mitzayir to the shear of uh, kviyas suda, and a person should wash and, and bench beforehand. So the question that some of the tibur wanted to know is with regards to making a kiddush on Shabbos. What would the reshiva recommend if the reshiva was making a kiddush in shul? Uh, what should we serve or not serve uh, in order to make sure that people don't <coughs> eat too much? A lot of people eat so much of the kiddush when they come home; they don't eat. We finished eating for the for the meal for the day. But then we should have said a mic and the cooking. Should have washed and should have said a mic. You're gonna have chalk and you're gonna have cooking and you're gonna have uh, all kinds of uh, nash and everything. But it's not much clear suda. Kahamabadya doesn't accept anything that's can I do. Real science. Everything else. So he says it's not correct, but it's only called clear suda if you ate the full kibetzim of the of the kids. But the Mishnah Bura quotes him, Moshe Bashan, so the Bell Fashi, he talked about the Mughan Ram. If you're gonna have a whole meal, then um, he says people go to a wedding and they don't want to stay to the end. So uh, but you, if you ate bread, you will keep the bench the zuna. So Moshe has a khidish if you have a mind in the beginning not not to stay to the end, so you're not Mukhiv and Zima taking or you can leave earlier. And he has a raya from the Shulchan Aruch. That it says that on Erev Tishba, when you eat the Suda Matzek, is the meaning is that you don't have three people eating together, because then you have to bench for Zuma, and it's a little too cheerful for Erev Tishba, we have to Even if you had three people eat together, Suda Matzek, and since the meaning is everybody knows that you don't make a Zimun, so it's as if they made it tonight, as if they said in advance, we don't want to be, we don't want to be mitzvah, yaka. So he says, you see from the Shulun out that if you said in advance, you had a mind not to be mitzvah to Zimun, so you're not mechuyif to bench mitzvah. Others say before Moshe was born, they already brought their rye and they slogged up the rye. They said they have tishba, we have tachasais. That's everybody knows that they have a mind not to have a mitzvah. But when you go to a wedding, not everybody knows that he has that in mind. So they say they're not happy about that. But uh, but so Moshe says, let's say you go to a wedding, and you don't want to stay to the end, you don't want to bench. But then, so they served the soup, and then they're going to serve the main course. You're hungry, you went to work a whole day, you're starving, you want to eat something. So they have a little cookies on the table, or they have uh, pretzels or something on the table. So the person is going to n- snack on the cookies or on the pretzels because he's hungry. Not as a snack, after he's ready finished, he's ready to plots because he ate so much, then you want to have a piece of cake. He eating the piece of cake because he's still hungry. So he said, that's Kriya Suda, that's part of the Kriya Suda. If you had a whole meal with fish and chicken and soup and everything and uh, everything, and then at the end you have a piece of cake as a snack, not to fill you up, you're ready full, you're ready to plant, then then the Magana Rams then doesn't apply. That's not called clear soup. But if you have the snack in the middle, that's a lot of people do. They're waiting and waiting for the next course. They were to work a whole day and they went straight to the wedding and they starved. So then they start nibbling on the cookies on the head. So he said that the Magana Ram said that's clear soup. So that depends. It's a lot of sides of Paul Chaham So by then, uh, it doesn't count. That's not called clear. So the Ashkenaz usually do follow the Mogan Avraham and the Mishnah. But that's called clear. Yeah. So before we always make an Erev Echatzeris with a box of matzahs. Usually use peso to get matzahs. Because uh, if you're going to use chalas and you're going to get stale, but then it, if, it, if it becomes spoiled, if it... Uh, what do you call it? Mold. It mold. develops mold. Then it's no good. If it's not edible, then it's no good for that. <coughs> so use matzah. It's not going to become moldy. So some tiny, it, but the Sephardim use, Sephardim all year long, same as I use matzah. They don't say hamoitzi. And the Gemara says, hey, will the chatzeris has to be lechem shem noach malav hamoitzi. So if you can make it right, that's kasha, that's a mistake. The Gemara said the favorite, that pas ha bobi kisnin, since if you would have been kadeh sudan, if you would have said hamoitzi, so... So, so, so matzahs are called pas. It's a subcategory of pas. Pas ha but it's pas. You can make an eruv with pie also, with cake also. It doesn't have to be bread. It's also called 
Lechem Shem Avacham Alav Amritzi. If you eat enough, it would have been Amritzi. That shows that it is Lechem. It's a Mafresh Chal on it. Like Lachok and the Lechem Or, it is Lechem. The subcategory of Lechem, subcategory, has an Afkamina for the Dinah de Rabbonah, where they say Hamotzi or Mazaynas, where they say Birchaz Hamoz, Naral Amichia, and where they wash until they said that night. All three are Dinah de Rabbonah, but on the level of the Rice, it's Lechem. Yechayla Nafrosh has Chalo. Yeah. So that that's the favorite. That matzah is good for a little bit even if they're inspired in the building, because it is called Pasha Mavacham Olam Amritzi. There's a din Pasakum is also. You know about eat Pasak, but if it's Paspalter, then many are makel. Pasakum is also because of it may lead to intermarriage. You may enjoy the bread that my next son ever made delicious bread. I was watching when he made it. All the ingredients are kosher. I know everything is kosher, but he's a nochri. So there's exera mishum. Mishum Chasnas, Mishum Ben Asayim. You're not allowed to eat the bread that was baked by the Nochim because he may decide to marry his uh, his daughter, and uh, and you'll have a large supply of this delicious bread. But if he's a doctor, <laughs> but but if he sells to everybody in the neighborhood, he's the baker. So why should I fall in love with his daughter? My guy will marry his daughter. So Tosis writes in Beit, so we pass along the Tosis. What if it's not pasbal? What if it's cake? So Tosis says, since if you eat enough cake. You would say hamoitzi. That's also called lechem. So that, that's that's called paspal. That's called it is pas. It's a subcategory of pas. It's pasal babikisna. <coughs> the difference between pasal babikisna and regular pas is only on the level of the rabbanon, where they need to be said that they say hamoitzi or mizaynis. That's the whole thing of the rabbanon. Where they say alamichi, they say bichas hamazon. The pashtu says that if you ate a whole meal and if you said you wash for bread, then you said alamichi. Many Rishanim assume your Yoytzeh men are Torah, the Birchaz Amar. It doesn't have to be three different brachas. If you have all the themes of the brachas in the, in the Alamithya, so uh, many Rishanim hold that your Yoytzeh, the Birchaz Amar is on there, I with that. So all the differences between cake and bread is only on the, the three differences, but it needs to be said, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, the adventure is on the All the three differences are just on the level of the Rabban, but for Pasakum purposes, or for, uh, or for, uh, so when making a kiddush, what should the shul do or Rama not? Rama has the same thing. The Rama says by matzah. The Gemara says that matzah shira he can't use for the mitzvah of matzah. So everybody says egg matzah is no good. According to the Rama, sheet the egg matzah is kosher for shmur matzah. Why? The Ramam holds that only the four mashkim that are mentioned in the Gemara, Yain, Shem, and Dvash, and Cholov. These are the only four mashkim. But if you have egg matzahs, it doesn't have any of the above, it doesn't have Yain, Shem, and Dvash, and Cholov, so it's not matzah, it's not matzah, so it's good. So the ask Kakashe, but the Ramam says himself, in Hukas Matzah, Chomus Matzah, that to be Yotze, the Matzah, and the El Pesach, has to be Lechem, Shem, and Vach, Molav, and Moitzi. And, and, uh, if it's if it's matzah if it's egg matzahs, it's same as zayinus on it. So the answer is no. If you eat a ton of egg matzahs, you would say I'm oitzi. That's called lechem shemavachem olav I'm oitzi. Matzahs have been you need lechem on. It has to be lechem. Chiyav chalus oy ban chok and the lechem are. It is lechem. It is it is lechem. It's a subcategory of lechem. This nafkemina being a subcategory is only for these three dinim there are bottom. About balamichia versus. Because I'm Muslim, I'm a Zionist, and I say, I'm a Zionist, and I say, I'm a Zionist, and I purposes, cake and cookies is, uh, is a lechem. If you have oatmeal cereal, that's not lechem. There's no loaf. That if you eat a ton of oatmeal cereal, you don't say, I'm a that, That's not lechem. And you have to wash on this cookie also? The cookie at the Kiddush that you, uh, you have to wash on it? Yeah, you should have to wash on it if you're going to eat a whole meal. Ashkenazim would consider it like that. That's considered clear soup. Whatever the servant okay. wanted to start with, uh, he wanted to be Kuvia Suda, uh, and he had a Kazais. And then he decided he's not going to have, should he bench now? He, had a, uh, he, he wanted to be Kuvia Suda and pass the Baba Kistan. To eat a lot. To eat a lot. And he only ate a little bit. He got a stomach ache in the middle, whatever. No. So now, does he need a bench or not? Because if, if it's viewed as pass, <coughs> right, for, let's say he had a Kabeza. Right, so kabitza of uh, kazais, you'd have to bench at then for his pass. So, but here, he had in mind, he washed, he said, I don't feel so, then he said, I'm And then he, 
He didn't end up eating. Oh, but you have to bench at the end of the night. Because of the Rishayim that the Rishiva quoted, that anyways it's a person could be Yaisid or Kesamazan with Al Michil? Or? No, the Maisi, he was not Kadir Sugar. He thought he was going to be Kadir Sugar. But yeah, but the Hamaiti that Maisi is good on the cookies also. You know what's the other way? You what? didn't, as a kid, you didn't think you were going to go for Yasuda in the end. You hate enough that it's going for Yasuda. So yeah, I mean, if originally he said, but I mean, yeah, and then it turns and out then that, it turns yeah, then he has to bench at the end. Yeah. But he doesn't have to wash. If, but he, he should have washed. He didn't know in advance. I don't know. Like, uh, he wasn't thinking. Right? Well, wasn't thinking. <laughs> he should have washed at the end. Yeah, but he didn't think. Yeah, he wasn't thinking. Shulchan Achid says that then, if a person started eating a little cake and he said, but I mean, Mizaynis, then he realizes that he's eating a ton of cake. Then he has to wash in the middle. And I think it says he says a mitzvah. Even though he already said mezayinus, he should say he's yotze but he with the mezayinus. I don't know. It says you have to wash in the middle to continue to eat more cake because he realized now that you, that you, that you were kavir sudan. We saw with uh, when learning the sugya of Pasa Baba Kisni, so the Shulchan Aruch at the end of Kuf Samachas, he discusses uh, pashtida, which is basically the piece of bread that's stuffed with meat or with cheese. And he says that's considered uh, that's considered bread, the whole daven. Why? And he quotes the Magen Avram, and the Magen Avram says because it's eaten as part of the meal. It's not a dessert. He says if you have the small bite-sized thing, so then yeah, it would be dessert. But if you have it, if it's meat stuffed in bread or bread stuffed with meat or cheese or whatever it is, so then the person would uh, would have to would have to wash. So Taz, he learns that no, anything that's stuffed is considered possible the kisni. And the Shulchan Aruch over there is referring to uh, when a person was kaveh sudan. When he was the Pashtidos, we still referring to the case when he's Kaveh Suda. Mishabur only brings the, the Magad Avram. Um, with regards to pizza, so would the Rashiva hold that pizza is considered a Mamisha Pashtida and the person would have to wash? Yeah, pizza means you bake the bread, you bake the sandwich with the cheese in it. When you bake it, it already has the cheese in it. So, person. I didn't understand that, but in the Ramadracha. <coughs> was a big fan of Ramayisha. He he was a big chassid. Everything Ramayisha. And this he didn't agree with Ramayisha. I thought the, I thought the time is over. Though. He said Ramayisha asked a thousand and one questions before he wrote his psak on the pizza. We didn't understand it. And he writes if he eat one slice of pizza, he says if he eat two slices of pizza, something. The pashta says that it's mamish pashtida. They bake the bread with the cheese in it. So that's how I say they baked it as bread with the cheese. Baked it as a sandwich. Why should that be pasta broke a kissing? Why should make a difference whether you eat one slice or two slices? You eat one slice. You ate a you ate a cheese sandwich. I didn't understand. What, what, if that, what if that dough was that dough was like I was at a pizza place this week and they said no the dough is it's uh, the liquid in there is mostly milk, not water. The what the what? That the the, the uh, dough liquid ingredient the, in the creation of the dough is no they said it's mostly milk, not flour, water. Flour and milk. Flour and milk. Yeah. Maybe more milk. than fifty yeah. percent yeah. is yeah. Yeah. milk. Nagid. They said mostly, so Nagido is yes, yes, yes. And Eric just saw a lot of the pizza shops yeah. do this. Yeah. They make so the they, they make the the batter of the dough with fifty one percent fruit juice or milk. Mm-hmm. So like that it has the second criteria of the Shulchanar of a pass above the kissing. That the dough itself is made with a majority of uh of liquid, uh, of uh, of uh, of milk or of fruit juice, oh. and then and then anyways the dough itself is considered part of the kisni. So you add the cheese. Who cares? Oh, That's no. what some places. Uh, or is that yeah. like the mizaynus roll? Mizaynus roll is. That's really. The OU refused to, on the airlines, they have mizaynus rolls, so the OU refused to give to put the OU on. It. Because it's it's not true, so it has five but the and doesn't have the OU. The rest of the food in the package all has the hechsher, the OU, but the mizaynus all do not have. It has a whole bunch of other chesidish. Thank you, a whole bunch of other hechsher, but it doesn't have the OU. So it's all the rabbanim and the OU. How that is mamish amaitzi? You can't tell the difference when you taste it. You can't tell the difference between that and another roll. Not this one. And the same bechara would be with the pizza, even though even though meaning. I don't know, you, you say it has so much uh, baked papers in it, so much milk in it. Okay. Maybe that itself makes it to be. Uh, They're trying to make a mizona. They're mitzvah saying. They, they say that. Oh, it's mizona. It's mizona. But, mm-hmm. So I asked them if it's. So it's then it would probably percent. be right, but Ram Moshe said then in such a case, if you eat two slices, then you're kavir suda. That's really filling. Even if it's milk. 
Yeah. 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 Okay. With regards to Lifnei, uh, if a person in Eretz Yisrael, it's common, a person has an irreligious uh, plumber that comes in. Um, so we saw a different sheet as if a person wants to offer him a cup of water. What does the Rishiva recommend? Uh, if you have a Chiloni uh, guest or a Chiloni uh, plumber or whatever it is, who comes, someone who's an electrician who's working in the house and you want to offer him a cup of water, how do you do that without being makshul him according to the Mishavru, according to the Shulchan Aruch who says that you can't give uh, someone food if he's not going to make a bracha? I don't know. It's a difficult chumrah. That's called if needed. If I give Trey food, that's called if needed. Give the person food. He has the option of saying a bracha if he wants to. That's his decision. You can't. I would marshal him. There's two opinions in Shulchan It's a difficult thing to to, to pass on like that. They have a story about Shlomo Zalman Oyabach that they once had a dedication. There were some people from from Chutzlords who gave a fortune of money from England and had a dedication of whatever a room or a building in the uh, Kol Torah in the yeshiva. And these these British uh, people were gave a fortune of money. They were sitting there the whole time, and it was a hot summer day, and they had no air conditioning. So after the whole dedication was over, so he invited them into his office, and they he gave them all a drink. So the Esrab Shlomo Zalman, you knew in advance that they weren't going to say a bracha. They didn't know how to say any brachas. So so the Esrab wasn't it. There's a chumah that is lift neiver. So he said, I was I had a dilemma. Either way, there's going to be a lifnev. If I'm not going to give them a drink, they'll think that I'm an idiot. And they'll think poorly of Tamir HaChachamim, and that's another era. And then they stop giving money to the yeshiva. So it's either a lifnev on an Avera de Raisa, or a lifnev on an Avera de Rabbanon. If I give them a drink, they don't say a bracha, the bracha sanen is only the Rabbanon. So he chose to violate the lesser of the two evils, to violate the lifnev de Rabbanon, as opposed to the lifnev de Raisa. That's one story that I think. Then they have in the biography of the Hazanish, they have that uh, there were people who had uh, uh, candy stores in Bnei Brak, and a lot of people came to buy soda. They didn't say a bracha, so they said, "How how can we sell soda to the people? They're not going to say a bracha." It's lift even. So the Hazanish has put up a sign in big letters: "The bracha on all the sodas in Shachak on the So there's no lift even. You told them to say a bracha. Then they say also, the biography of the Chazanish, they say when Ben Gurion came to visit the Chazanish, he gave him a drink. Chazanish gave him a drink. So he said, You know, he wasn't going to say a bracha. So he said, I said the bracha out loud. I had in mind, if he wants to be Yitzhak, he can be Yitzhak. So I said the bracha. He could have said the bracha. It's not always listening. The whole thing is a chumrah. I gave him kosher food. He had a prayer to say a bracha. The whole thing is a chumid that I should say the bracha. I should put up a sign. No, no. But if you put up a sign, all the, all the brachas, the brachas on all the sodas are shahakal. So it's already no lifts Well, the shayla might be more if you're selling wine to someone who's not religious. So when he opens it, it becomes. <laughs> so then it becomes be'etzim aser. So the chazanish. <laughs> Holds like the Binyan Sibin and Sir Rabbi Yanki Vetlinger lived in Germany at the beginning of the reform movement. And he says, We don't have Machal Shabbos Prefahes here. This man is a Deshad Asalam. Machal Shabbos Prefahes means he's breaking the discipline in the community. All the people are Shammah Shabbos, he's breaking the discipline. If Roiva, the Jews in the world are Machal Shabbos, everybody's Machal. That's called Prefahes. It's called Machal Shabbos Bemezid. But Bemezid is still not Prefahes. Prefahes him. Gemara says means he's not embarrassed to be Mechal Shabbos in the presence of the chief rabbi. Gemara said there was once a Jew who was wearing a signet ring on Shabbos. There was no Erev. And that's not uh, that's not a Tachshit. That's, that's carrying a pen. Instead of carrying the pen, I have the pen on my finger and I put my, signa, my, my signature on. So the fellow was wearing a signet ring on Shabbos. But when the chief rabbi walked by, he was embarrassed. So he covered it up. So the Gemara said that's not Mechal Shabbos Befehesi. For many, there's a fellow who lives in my building. I live in a apartment building in Washington Heights. There's a fellow who went to Yeshiva College. Now he's not a Shemel Mitzvah at all. He doesn't keep anything. But he's embarrassed that for many years there was no Arab in Washington Heights. Now they have an Arab. So for many years, this guy would carry the keys in his pocket. But when I would be there, I would, be, I would come back from the Yeshiva late. 
in yeshiva, they take turns every week, a different rabbi he stays there and he starts, speaks with the boys. So one night, one Friday night, we, a few times, not one, quite a few times, we came back uh, at 12 o'clock at night from yeshiva, and we were locked out of the building. We couldn't get in, so we were waiting for someone. And someone's always going to come in a half an hour. So we're waiting. So this guy came with the key in his pocket. He wouldn't open the door when I was there. <laughs> he went around the block. It's a very big block. 181st to 184th, very gigantic. He would come back 10 minutes later, we were still there, he would walk out again. <laughs> he, wouldn't, he wouldn't show in my presence. He was embarrassed to let me see that he's carrying the key. Now there's an error, so he doesn't have to be embarrassed over the Yudjah's news camera. So he's carrying all kinds of things. So to be Mahasin, that the Chazanish holds like that also. Chazanish writes in the Chelik every day. Al Shabbos Mephahes, he is more than amazing means he's breaking the discipline in the community. But since there's so many Reform and Conservative Jews on Mahal Shabbos, so they're, they're those, those on Mahal Shabbos, they, you can't say they're breaking discipline. That's the roi of the Jews on Mahal Shabbos. But they don't have a din of din akak. In terms of chinuch, uh, with regards to brachos, at what age will we be mechanic kids to say brachos? And then what happens if they're Saying brachos in the they they wash and then oh shakol on the cup of water and uh, apple comes out or uh, the pasta or make a on that. What would the Shiva recommend? At what age to start and then how much discipline should be involved with uh, actual halachos? Sometimes you have no choice. I've gone there already teaching the children to say brachos at a very young age. You can't contradict what they're doing in the gun. Can't say they're doing, can't tell the child they're doing wrong and you shouldn't say bracha because then you're going to ruin the whole chinuch of the child. You can't say the teaching is wrong. But it's not really right. You shouldn't encourage a child to say bracha if he doesn't have a muslim of what the Rabbanu Shalom is. He doesn't know what it means. He's praying to the Rabbanu Shalom that he makes the trees grow, that he makes everything grow. He doesn't know what it's all about. He just thinks that you mumble a couple of words. He doesn't know what a lakus is. Oh, you have to. I, I, you have to ask my wife, you have to ask your wife, at what age, I, I'm an old man already, I already forgot uh, what age they start. But uh, it's not such a young young age. The child has to have a musa that is talking to the Rabbi Shalom, he's thanking him for, for making all these foods available. That's much later. That's yeah. six, seven, eight. Because uh, uh, here in Eretz so they teach him two-year-olds really? already. Yeah. <laughs> not right. They have no muslim. That's really a bracha rata. They have no muslim. Thank you. My son was making a shakal on a baby bottle. <laughs> <laughs> Three years old. He, was, uh, and he didn't know what he was saying, but he knew that he couldn't drink unless he makes the bracha. Yeah. A muslim of Elokus or a muslim of thank you? Why saying thank you thank to you? whom? Thank you to whom? So you have to tell him that there's somebody who gives us all this food. Yes, to know there's such a being as the Rabban Shalom. He doesn't understand what that is. So what is he saying at bracha? He has to have some musik. The Gemara says, I buy a rubber when they were young children. So they asked him, where is the Rabban Shalom? So I forgot, I think rubber pointed up to the ceiling. And I walked outside and he pointed up to the sky. The Gemara, okay, good enough. So he understood something about all the goods. They must be very young children. As long as they know the Rabban Shalom is somewhere over there, He's not over here. He's, there is somebody there who is some, somewhere above them. So that's called, uh, he understands. But before that age, well, you'll ask him who's the bunch of has no hasogi. That's a bracha of Even though it will be harder to train in by then. <laughs> a few shout outs from the previous man. Halak a person, um, could a person shower? Before chakras, we saw different shitas lekan v'lekan. If a person, if it's going to stare his davening or his learning beforehand, it's going to stare his uh, his davening and and the learning that he, he plans to take do. A shower. Right, he would take a shower on Sunday morning also when he doesn't go to work. That's yeah, in America, he doesn't go to work. He takes a shower in order to daven well. That's okay, but he's taking a shower on the other days of the week because he has to go to the office on Sunday. He doesn't take a shower before. That shows he's taking the shower for the work, not for the dawah. And then I let it prepare for the work before. The <coughs> and with shampoo and everything would be okay. Yeah. He wants to feel clean to be able to dawah. That's beautiful. Some people go to mikvah before they dawah. That's beautiful. Um, with regards to... 
we asked this in the past, but I guess it's good to, to hear again. With regards to like a, 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 a balance between Chinuch Habanim and going out to work and Ishtadlus, what's the... Is, is there a way to quantify how much Ishtadlus a person needs to put in and then how much time does he need to spend with his wife and with his kids and learning? How would he be... How much Ishtadlus with Parnassa? Yeah. If a guy can work a half a day and make enough to make ends meet, and then the rest of the day he'll be able to learn. So, so you're not allowed to you're not allowed to work all not allowed to work a whole day. You can work a whole day and make a million dollars a year. You work half a day and make a half a million dollars. You can live on a half a million dollars a year. But then you're not allowed to work a whole day. Unless he's unless he just can't concentrate, he won't be able to learn. If he can't learn Gemara with Tysus with Masha, but Tilim he can learn, Tanakh he can learn, Kitsu Shulchan Aruch, you know, it's also learning. We don't measure it, can he learn Gemara with Tysus? Can he read Kitsu Shulchan Aruch? That's also learning. Everything is learning. He used to be a Rebbe in Yeshiva. He used to learn half a day, then he went to work half a day, he made enough to make ends meet, and that was it. And so, uh, he worked half a day. I remember that I tell that story. I once... Uh, I was once in California. The OU used to have a um, Yarche Kala, they called it. They used to have a week of learning between December 25th and January 1st. So I used to go for many years. And then now they don't have a whole week. A lot of people take off from work. They take off from graduate school. There's no graduate school there. So they used to have big crowds came to the Now they don't have them anymore a whole week. Now they just have a weekend, an extended weekend, so they have shoes. So I remember um, at the end of the December, so I was there at the uh, OU Yarche Kala, what they called it in California. Then I went on, a, on an El Al plane to go to Eretz Yisrael to visit all the Shivas in Eretz Yisrael. So there was somebody there, I, they always sent me an economy class. So uh, there was someone from the business class who went to use the restroom in the back. He looked very familiar to me. She I remember exactly how. And then on his way back to the, his seat, so he, uh, so he stops my mic and he says, Hi, Rev. So I'm all He was in my shear a long time ago, 50 years ago. And this story happened 40 years ago. So I say, What do you do now? What are you up to? He lives in Eretz Israel now. He moved with his family, his wife and children, to Eretz Israel. Uh, he used to do uh, radiology. He was a radiologist in Los Angeles. He said he made $2 million a year. I was going to make $2 million a year. I can't even count so much. $2 million a year. And he decided he's going on Aliyah. Yeah, he was wearing jeans. He was wearing jeans, torn jeans, with sneakers, without socks. So he tells me he used to make $2 million a year. Now he went on Aliyah and he bought a home in Savion, where all the poor people live. <laughs> he only makes a half a million dollars a year. And his wife can't get used to living in poverty. So he went back to California to get back his job in the hospital. He has to move back from there. His wife can't get back, she can't get used to living in poverty, only make a half a million dollars. Anyway, so that's, uh, so that's the din. You're allowed to go to work. You only have to learn when you have free time. It's not that Parnas is so important, that Parnas is Dechet Talmud Torah. The Ochi of Talmud Torah only, that's the Bira the beginning of Peya, Amishnah is Peya. You only have to learn when you have free time. So when you have to go to work, you have to sleep, you have to spend time with your wife, you have to spend time with your children. So that's not free time. A person should try to make as much free time as possible. So if he can make, he can, if he works half a day, he'll make a half a million dollars. He works all day, and make a million dollars. And if he's free half a day, he'll talk, learn half a day. He'll learn, he'll learn Tanakh, he'll learn Kitsu Shalonach, he'll learn Gemar, he'll learn Mishnah, he'll learn something. So he, that's free time. He's not allowed to. He's not allowed to work all day to make a million dollars. Doesn't need so much money. He can work a half a, half a day and work a, make a half a million dollars. Yeah. You want to believe to learn when there's free time. What's the greatest lesson we can teach our children? The greatest lesson? We have to teach them a little history. I knew my grandparents. I knew both sets of my grand I was raised by my mother's parents because I, I was brought up in Pennsylvania. There was no yeshiva then. So the day school only went to the fifth grade. So my parents had to send me to New York. All the parents who wanted more Torah education for their sons, 
I had to send them to Baltimore. My parents sent me to New York because my grandparents lived there. <coughs> so I knew my I knew my both sets of grandparents, and they knew their parents and their grandparents, and they knew their parents and their grandparents. And we have a historical tradition that there were several million people. There were Shish and Reba men between the age of 20 and 60. There were probably Shish and Reba women, women between the age of probably the same amount, same amount of people. Then there were people over 60. Then there were people younger than 20. And then there was Ayla Drops. So there were several million people witnessed the Gilish Khina on the occasion of Makas Bechoris and Kriyos Yamsur Mana Asina. So we have a historical tradition that God exists and there's only one God and there's Chavi Yonish and there's Yidli and there's Bechira and there's Shechina Metaber and Tachron and there's Torah and there's Nevoah and there's Nevoah and was a Novi and Moshe Ben was Shechina. All of the Yikori Amun were demonstrated to the to the to convince all of these people that all these things were true. And this is a historical tradition, like uh, in America, people will deny that George Washington was the first president on the There's nobody alive today who remembers, but all history books they have a historical record that it's so. We have, our nation has a historical record of all the Ikori HaMunah. And that's what C.P. Tzism time is all about. On Leel Pesach it says, the Chumash it says, on Man removes most of the Eretz Mitzayim, Yitaitem Kali Hashem, I'm going to make these in the floors that everyone should know all the Ikori HaMunah. On Pesach night, when you tell over the story of Tzitz Mitzrayim, you have to fear us, you have to say, and that's how we realize, that's when we came to the realization that God exists and there's only one God, and there's, and there's Chavi Yonish, and there's Yedir, and there's Bechir, and so on. You have to, and there's Nevoah, and there's Tfilo, you have to mention all the Korea Munim. And this is so clear to our parents and grandparents and our ancestors, they were prepared to give their lives on this. Many of them didn't give their lives, they didn't have the, the Koyach to. But many of our ancestors would be saying, Moise and Nevesh al-Kiddush Hashem, it's not a Baba Moise, it's not like Santa Claus. They tell Santa Claus and then they reach a certain age and tell them the whole thing was a Baba Moise, the whole thing was a joke. But also it's not a Baba Moise. They were prepared to be Moise and Nevesh, those who had the Koyach to, they were prepared to give up their lives on these, on these things. That's what we have to impress upon our children. These are historical facts. These are things that really happened. I was here in the summertime, I was here in the summertime, so they took me on a tour one day. There was nothing happening by the NCSY group, so they took me on a tour to see the Mizbeach uh, that Yeshua ben Nun made. And Harry Bo. And So the professor who did all the work had already passed away. So one of his students was telling us. So he said, this professor who discovered the Mizbeach, he was brought up a secular Jew. And he was brought up that everything it says in Tanakh is Baba Maisa. So he never believed that there was a Yeshua ben Nun made him his Bech and Harivah. I didn't believe in anything. But he said, Balkocha, he couldn't deny it. There's a Mizbech and Harivah. Gigantic Mizbech. I never saw such a big thing. A square Mizbech. He said, clearly, this is the Mizbech of Yeshua ben Nun. And then the, the one who was giving us the tour was also a secular Jew. He wasn't religious, but he was telling us about the other one. Then he was telling us also that there's some professor at Hebrew University didn't believe there was such a person as David Amalek. So the other professors did research and they found absolute evidence that there was such a person as David Amalek. Then he denied that David Amalek was a Melek over all of Eretz So Then they did more research. They proved clear cut evidence for Ferenc. Everything that the other Apikoris professor was denying, that it's all Baba Mises, within a half a year they proved conclusively that it was. Abraham Avinu was a person who really existed. And Yitzchak Avinu, Yankev Avinu. In the days of the Rajbo, there were those who claimed that Avinu and Yankev, these are concepts. They weren't real people concepts. The Rajbo said, that's not true. They were real. Our tradition has it. They were real people. They represent certain concepts also. People represent ideas, but they were real people. We have to have our children realize this is real history. There's real things. It's not Baba Mises. And it's so real that our, our ancestors, those who had the Kirtu, would be Moisa Nefesh, Al-Kiddush Hashem, they would give their lives, and that's the Damaya Chayi. Because they were Moisa Nefesh, they would give their lives. That's where the Jewish people lives on, because we believe in these things. This really happened. It's not a question of believing. It's like history. You believe that George Washington is not a, an Amuna. We have a historical tradition that this is so. Yeah, we have to, our children, this, the outside world is placing so much pressure on everybody to, to deny everything. 
So we have to keep on chazuk with our children. We have a very strong historical tradition. There were several, mil- several million people, including the men, the women, and over 80, over 60, or younger than 20, in the era of Rav, several million people saw all of these nisim and the floors, and it demonstrated to them all the ikoriyam. That's why we have to be machanach on children. One of this. Um, what were some of the special qualities of Rav Salavechik in relations to other G'dol Yisrael and his generation? What do you mean in relation? As opposed to the other G'dolim that existed then. As opposed to the other? Or, yeah. What made, what made the Rav unique compared to other G'dolim? Thank you. A lot of things made him unique. He had an awful lot of traditions. Most of the things that he said were not his <coughs> original. He would say, oh, Van Gemara, he would say, the Gzais and the Sivas and so on, but he would say it more Bishmak than the Gzais said. <laughs> he would say it with an oomph. He would say the same thing as everybody else, but he would say it so much clearer. I remember sometimes he would quote a Pesach in the middle of this year. He wouldn't give any commentary. He would just quote a Pesach and pause in the middle. And I would think to myself, that's Pshat and the Pasim, the way he paused. I never realized. He was supposed to pause over there. I was supposed to read it again. Ooh, he just said a Pasim. That's all. <laughs> or he would say a did in the Gemara. Say, would say, what did it say in the Gemara? So we would say, the Gemara always tells you in a case, case history. So say it over in abstract. He would say it over. We would kick ourselves. We didn't realize. That's what it said in the Gemara. We didn't realize that. It's like uh, the Gemara says in Sukkot, that uh, Morris says in Sukkot that uh, a blazer Ben Horkin is had a policy he wouldn't say Darvish Leishom Ami Rabbi he would only say things that he heard from his Rebbe so they so they ask Akasha how can that be but in the Pirke the Reb Lezer I think it says or there's a Zohar somewhere the sources of his Reb Nosen of his Reb Nosen a Pirke the Reb Lezer the Reb Lezer was speaking on one occasion. He said, No one ever heard such chidush in Torah since the days of my Masina. So how can the Gemara say that he only said, He only said other things that he heard from his Rebbe. So I think Rav Kook quoted from the Avdei Nezer. Rav Kook never had an Avdei Nezer. But Rav Kook, Rav Kook never joined the Mizrahi on policy. I don't know what the policy was. He never joined the Mizrahi. He always belonged to Aguda. He was a member of the Vat Ma'atzidah Torah till the day that he died. And he was already living in Eretz Yisrael. And he went to Chutzlot to attend the Knesset Hagdaila of the Aguda. And the First World War broke out and he couldn't come back. So he got stuck in Poland for a while. I think in Poland, no, in Switzerland. I forgot it right. Then he went to London for a year. Switzerland. Switzerland. So in Switzerland, he stayed by some religious family. They had an Avdei Neza. So he came across this Avdei Neza. Where's this Kasha? How can it be? The Rab Lezer Ben Hurkin, so the Lezer Avdel said, Dorm Shalosh Hamas and Lezer Nisina, but the Gemara says he only said, Dorm Shesham and Pirabba. So the Avdel Nisina said, He was so keen, he heard from the Rebbe things that no one else heard. He said, The Rebbe said X, and that means Y, and that means Z, and that means X, Y, Z, and that means a lot of things. The others didn't pay so much attention. He understood from the Rebbe more. Rabbi Salvech, he would do that all the time. He would say a Gemara, and then he said, what does it say in the Gemara? So he said, Robin. No, no, what does it say? He said, Robin, in other words. We didn't realize. That's what it said. When you extrapolate from the Gemara, what's the cloud? Really? That's what it said in the Gemara. He would always give the most Pashup shot. He would, uh, he would ask a kasha, and then the students would give <laughs> suggestions, a terrorist. So he would always say, oh, with a Nesnag the joke that the Chesidah Shireb was saying Chesidah Shireb is Torah and Parshat Lech Lecha so he was discussing how come Lech Lecha is written in the Chumash with two big chesim so there was a Mesnaga there he said Rebbe first of all it's spelled with two chafs and secondly it's the same size as the other letter it's not bigger than the other letter so the Chesidah Shireb said that's one teretz I have a better teretz <laughs> <laughs> that's what Rabbi Salvation said you give me one teretz I have a better what do you need? Your town so complicated, cockeyed right around and around. No, go straight to the point. That's an easy answer. And science is also like that. If you have a phenomenon that you don't understand, then there are two ways to explain it. So one is very complicated, and there is glut. So 99% of the time, the glut, the explanation, is always the correct one. And halacha is also the same. 
if you can explain that law in a very convoluted way, I can explain it very simply. Usually the Pasha Bishat is there, Mr. Pshat. He would always give the most Pasha to Pshat. We would kick ourselves after this year. Why didn't we realize that? that there was no Kasha. We misread the Gemara. That's how they say that Beis Alevi made a comment. That when they asked the Beis Alevi a Kasha, he would give a good Teretz and he said, they would walk away. I was happy, he was happy, he was happy, he asked a good Kasha, I was happy, I said he was Teretz. But when they ask my son Chaim, a good Kasha, and he gives a Teretz, they both walk away, say, Rab Chaim reinterprets, the Gemara comes out that the Kasha was based on a mistake, that the one who asked the Kasha didn't understand Pshat, and I thought originally it was a Kasha because I didn't understand Pshat either, and now that we know the right Pshat, there was no Kasha and there was no Teretz, it was a misunderstanding, everything. That's what the Beis HaLevi said about Rab Chaim. That's Rab Chaim, you go to time. He didn't say, some of the boys in the Shi used to go to Pirche on Shabbos afternoon, the Pirche Aguda. So every week they used to alternate, the older boys, every, every week. So one would say, Ashtikul Tur, then he heard from his Rebbe Tur Vedas, the other one learned Chaim Malin, the other one learned the Yad Tevigesim. He learned by Rab Salvech. He said he couldn't tell over Ashtikul Tur. Ashtikul Tur, if they say a juicy kasha, he say a juicy terrace. Rab Salvech say a juicy kasha, then it comes out, you misunderstood the Gemara. There wasn't a pshat. He said the correct pshat, so you have to first falsify, you have to say the Gemara wrong, you have to say over the Gemara incorrectly. And then he asked Kaklot's Kasha, that was a mistake, and then give it there. He said, yeah, I said over the Gemara rooms. How can you say that? He could, it was hard to say over. He used, a lot of times he would leave out the Kasha, he would just give the Pshat. So a lot of students would wonder, what motivated them to say this crazy Pshat? Why did he say that Pshat? Then we looked at the Rishonim, we saw why, because Rishonim had Kashas, because they understood the Gemara differently. And then they, after they answered it, it came out that we misunderstood the Pshat. He was always, there. everything was the most posh Pshat. Most Even if he learned the Gemara, he, he would always look at the Gemara new. He didn't want to hear the boys tell him, what did he say last time, five years ago or ten years ago when he learned his Gemara. He would look at the Gemara new today, what does it say? Sometimes he would say the same as last time, sometimes he would say it a little differently. So he, at any given Gemara, he would say different ways. Then you have to pick out which was the best version. <laughs> he wouldn't always say exactly the same thing each time. Each time he would be open-minded to try to see what's the pshat. He's always looking for the most poshet the pshat in the Gemara. And he had a lot of traditions, a lot of traditions. He had a good memory. He remembered what a lot of people told him. Most of what he said was not his original. Most of what he said, he was saying over what he saw in the and Kiddush, but he said it over in his own language, and his own Lushayness. He didn't like the yeshivish stuff. There's one person, in, uh, one of the rabbis in Wayu, who wants to convert Rabbi Salvech to make him more yeshivish. So he took all of his shiur, and he converted everything to Gaber, Chef, Tzimalos, Kiyom. He put in all the catchwords, all the catchphrases. Rabbi Salvech didn't speak like that. Every Gemara, he had different Lushayness based on, based on what the sugya said. He wouldn't, like you're forcing the Gemara into a straitjacket. Every Gemara has to fit into Gabra Chef Kim. You don't have to do that. Every Gemara speaks for itself. The Gemara, each Gemara has different terminology depending what you're learning. He was Machadish also, but he was a, he, most of what he said was not his original. Most of what he said. He would say over from others, but he would give it finishing touches. He would uh, he would touch everything up. Poshim shot. Everything by him was always very poshim shot. Hashkafa was also very straightforward, very poshim shot. All the Hashkafa was based on Psukim, based on Ramban Ban Chumash, based on Ramban Ban Didim. I remember someone from America said, I once told me that Rav Kook has an essay that when you want to present Hashkafa of the Jewish religion, it's best to present it based on halachas. But to present Hashkafa based on Agadita, so you can always interpret Agadita differently. We don't know exactly how to interpret Agadita, but halacha, we know what the din is. So if you develop Hashkafa from the halacha, that's the best thing. So this uh, Talmud Chacham, this fellow's name is Rabbi Sugarman. He used to be in the Rosh Hashimah Chispin. I think he retired now. So he said, Rav Cook recommends it, but he hardly does it himself. He said, the one who does it more is Rav Salavachim. 
Now, so eventually he used to give his yard side drush on his father's yard side every year on Gimel Shvan. He would give a drush for four hours, and the people would sit glued to their seats for four hours. And he had a style, he had a very good style. He would say in Yiddish, Zolach weiter gang! Should I continue? It's already deep into the night. And everybody would scream out, yes, to keep everybody's attention. And he would say, you can't go home anyway in Yiddish. He'd say, you can't go home, it's snowing outside. You were arrested here. You can't go home anyway, so he's going to continue. So he would say a shir for two hours. He would present, he would first say, over Gemara. Then he would, he sent out Marma Karmas and the Say over Gemara, then he would list a whole bunch of kashas. He presented, he worded the kashas such a way no one can answer those kashas. Then he presented another Gemara. All the Gemara is on the Marmakar. Then he presented another Gemara. He said, What do you see from the other Gemara? Are you saying? And all the kashas fell away. Everything fell away. So he would present this for two hours. He could have, he could have said it in a half an hour, but they had Balabatim, so he had to say, Explain everything. So explained it. And then he would give a drasha two hours of hashkafa based on the halacha that he just presented. They did this every year on the Yotzai drasha, every year. He would have hashkafa based on halacha. That's what Rabbi Sugarman pointed out. Interesting that uh, Rav Cook recommends it, but he himself hardly ever did it. Rav Soloveitchik did it. He would develop the halacha from the hashkafa. He had a lot of uh, a lot of interesting things, but he had a lot of different hanhogas. All the hanhogas, the, most of them are not his. Some of them were original. Most of them were from his father, from his grandfather, from the other grandfather, from this tzaddik, from the other tzaddik. He would tell you, if you listen to the shir long enough, many of the students weren't in the shir long enough, so they thought he was like a madman in a chemistry lab mixing chemicals and making <laughs> explosions. He's making up new things from thin air. He wasn't making up. These are traditions that he saw back then. He would tell you. He saw this Adam Gold, this like this, and this like that. And everything was based on Gemaris and Rishayinim. Said over from his father, this is printed already. This said over from his father. The Taisus on the first daf in Baba Basra shows from the Rabbeinu Talmud that uh, you're not mukhayif to follow a minik shtus. You're not mukhayif to observe every minik. There's a minik shtus, you're not mukhayif. And the Rabbeinu Talmud has a chuba where he says minik is spelled mem nun hein gimel, same in the, in the letters that spell gehenim, gimel hein nun mem. If you observe a minik, it goes straight to gehenim. So Rabbeinu Talmud says in a chuba, it depends which minik is a minik shtus, that's gehenim. <laughs> So what's the definition of minik shtus? So Rab Rab Moshe Salavechik said this. Rab Salavechik followed this very much. Minik shtus does mean a minik that doesn't have a good explanation. Every minik has a good explanation. We're not talking about stupid minik. Minik shtus, he said, means a minik that has no kiyum. Every minik has to have a kiyum of something or another. And if there's no kiyum, then it's called a minik shtus. So he spoke more than all put together. Moshe Feinstein, Rabbi Akiv Kamenetsky, Rabbi Hutner, and uh, Rabbi Gifter, all, all the Rabbana with that channel, all the Rosh Yeshiva. He spent more time explaining in Hagim than all of them put together. And he would explain what the Kiyom is in every minute. This is a king, why you wear a kittel all day long. That's a Kiyom of, uh, of COVID, quoted at Miri and Shab, that's a Yom Kippur. Why so? Because you don't have lighting, you only have kibbutz, you have to. You have to emphasize the kibbutz. Duma, he, he spent a lot of time explaining what's the kiyum of the meaning. A meaning that has no kiyum even has a good reason. That's called the meaning of shtus. He had a lot of, a lot of things that were really, really unique. He used to enjoy talking and learning with the other rabbi. He would talk to Rabbi Aaron Kotler when they would meet together at the Rabbi Yavim Met. They would meet sometimes at a Besa Oval. They would meet at a Sheva Hassan or something. So they would, uh, they would get involved in talking and learning. They enjoyed uh, talking to each other and learning. Rabbi Yaakov Kavanetsky, before he went to Torvadas, so he, was, he was still in Toronto. So he came specially, he made an appointment to meet with Rabbi Zolvechik. He wanted to found a, a yeshiva in Boston. The Rabbi Zolvechik should be the Magachin, he'll be the Mashgiach. So Rabbi Zolvechik said he doesn't think they're ready for it yet. He wanted to make a coil like that. But he was, uh, he was, uh, he was very gung-ho. He wanted to go to shoot with Rabbi Zolvechik. Rabbi Shneer Kutten used to talk about Rabbi Zolvechik all the time on the phone. He enjoyed talking and learning with uh, with others. He appreciated. He had a very good memory. He told me when uh, 
Rabbi Wunderman was the chief rabbi of Eretz Yisrael. Rabbi Herzog passed away. Rabbi Wunderman was. Rabbi Wunderman was a big Talmud Chacham. So uh, they asked Rabbi Soloveitchik, would he want to go visit Rabbi Wunderman? He's in a hotel. So he said, yeah, he remembers him from Europe. So he met him, he, they made an appointment, he went to the hotel, he met him, and he said, Rabbi Soloveitchik reminded him that this is not the first time that he met him. He met him after 60 years before that he once visited his grandfather, Rab Chaim, and he was a little child, and he remembered the shtikl turd that he told Rab Chaim. And he told him over what the shtikl turd was. He said, wow, he remembered what it was. So, they, so the one who drove Rabbi Soloveitchik said to him, wow, I see that, you, that you're really strong at learning. He says, no, Wunterman is strong at learning. I have a good memory. Wunterman <laughs> is a big bummer, Chadish. He had a very good memory for learning. He remembered all the Gemaras, he remembered all the, all the associations. He was very unusual. He always gave the Poshim Shah, the most Poshim Shah. And he wasn't interested in reading all the Rishan. You've got to read all the Rishan, you won't reach that base on the base. He was only interested in Rashi Tesis and the Rambam. He said, Rashi Tesis and Rambam have on all of Shas. Whenever you have something in the Gemara, there's always a Gemara if I care. So you always have to figure out how does it jive with the other Gemara. Sometimes it's a Machlaikis, there's Gemara in Gemara. Sometimes not a Machlaikis. So how does it jive? So if you have Rashi Taisus and the Rama among all of Shas, so then it's good. The other kids for you that they print, you only have Angitan. So how do you know how you read the Gemara in Arabic? How do you know how, how is the application? So he was never really interested in the others. If there'll be a famous Rajbo, a famous Ran, or a famous Rosh that's quoted in Shulchan Aruch, okay, he's going to do it. The Ramban, the reader Mohammed, that was a challenge. That was like climbing Mount Everest. To read the Ramban and to know every line, that he would always do. That was a challenge there. He would be so excited, the Ramban. He said, Ramban knew all of Shas, and there was no Masar Sashas. Ramban knew how to relate to all the different ones. But that Masar Sashas. Ramban Zira. Uh, basically, it's just it's just into the Gemara, Rashi Tesis, and the Rambam. That was his whole focus. When he gave a shiur on Gemara, there's some people that are so into Psak. Allah, <coughs> the shiur Gemara is basically they're just saying over Psak. Other people are so into Pilpul. When he gave a shiur on Shulchan Aruch, they make a Pilpul out of Shulchan Aruch. Rabbi Soloveitchik, when he gave a shiur on Gemara, it was a shiur on Gemara. When he gave a shiur on Shulchan Aruch, he was explaining how you pass. When he gave a drasha, it was a drasha. <coughs> He didn't say a drasha when he was giving a shia, the shia. He said, when someone said a smart didn't like, they said, that's philosophy. That was a dirty word, that's philosophy. <laughs> he doesn't want philosophy, he wants gemara, learning. And when you psak is psak, and a drasha is a drasha, three different things. <coughs> Unlike others, others will make everything his drasha, others, others will make everything into pilpo. By him, the pilpul of the Gemara was a pilpul style, and the Shulchan Aruch was a Shulchan Aruch style, Psak Halacha style. He was very good in Psak Halacha. He used to analyze the case and show you which sif applies, which sif doesn't apply. Remember, we learned the sif in Shulchan Aruch in Yeridea. So he said, How many of you have ever visited Eretz Yisrael? Nobody raised their hand. That class with 30 students. This was years, years ago. Nobody. They were all 20 years old. Nobody had visited Eretz Yisrael. That was before the system was set up that everybody goes to learn in Eretz Yisrael for a year <coughs> between high school and college. So he says, he visited Eretz Yisrael and he visited Tzvat and Shulchan Aruch. Rabbi Yisrael lived in Tzvat and it's on top of a mountain. They have to pay the Arabs. There was no uh, there was no plumbing system. You had to pay the Arabs who schlepped the water up to the top. So that's why the dinner Shulchan Aruch is. That's Tzach Lohis Yolab It's not called the Dovish Eshel Matir. But today, turn on the faucet, the din of Shulchan Aruch doesn't apply. He would explain, the din of depend, you have to understand the din. If the conditions are different, so the whole din doesn't apply. It's a different din, different case, different din. A lot of things, a lot to talk about. <laughs> Very good. We have uh, Rabbi, you want to say words? We have this host to have uh, Rabbi Berman, who's the president of OU Israel here. 